this is part two of um, two videos um, on brain imaging in autism. I want to talk to you about brain imaging because I would like to share the experience I had with my son of doing this uh, technique in order to help us to understand um, um, his condition. Um, but in order to place the result within a broader con um, context, I'd like to give you more information about the various techniques available there and what has been actually published in that area in autism. There are many good reasons for looking at brain structure and brain function in autism. Autism is a developmental disorder characterized by a socialization and communication impairment and very commonly the affected individuals are involved in a limited range of activities and self-stimulatory behaviors. Ultimately, the brain must be involved in these behaviors. So it makes sense to try to see which abnormality in terms of structure or function can be seen across individuals. And there have been many studies done to look at the brain structure and function. And I'm going to talk to you about this now. Okay. One way to look at the brain structure is of course to look at it under the microscope. Ramon Cajal spent much of his waking hours studying the structure of the brain under the microscope. Because it was not possible to take picture at the time, he was drawing endlessly all the structure he could see. Here you see the hippocampus, and here you can see some cells, the Purkinje cells, inside the cerebellum. Of course, microscopy has evolved a sense. Not only microscopes are much more powerful now, but there are all sorts of techniques now of staining to look at cells and with the use of um, label antibodies to stain specifically certain cells and even certain cells under certain state of activation. Here is a study done on post-mortem brains uh, uh, by Dr. Vargas published in 2005. The study was done on 11 brains of autistic children and 12 controls. And what you can see here is the structural abnormalities which were detected both in a cerebellum and in a cortex. In a cerebellum, here you see a controlled brain with a densely packed uh, granular cell layer in a cerebellum. And here is the ASD, uh, ASD subject with much more patchy density. When specific dyes and staining were used to uh, detect um, activated microglia, there was much staining in an ASD sample. This is also what you can see in these pictures here. The studies show widespread inflammation throughout the brains of all the 11 samples. But of course, it's not very easy and not very feasible to do much studies on postmortem brains of children with autism. We need another technique, and one other technique you could use is called MRI for magnetic resonance imaging. Um, this technique was very much available in the 80s and onwards in clinical work, and it's enabled to detect water content. And with this, you can not only detect the structure of the brain, but you can look at inflammation, tumor, viral infection, and bleeding. Much studies has been done in autism using six technique. But what is very striking is that the findings are very, very disparate. Some uh, researchers argue, uh, say, for example, the hippocampus is larger in some studies, whilst others say it's unchanged or smaller. In fact, there is no consensus other than being agreed viability among subjects and among studies. And it doesn't seem to be attributed to the technology involved as it is pretty much worked out now. One has to highlight the fact that MRI imaging does not enable to detect function. That's why people have been looking at other imaging technology. Another type of technology is Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or FMRI. Here what you have is the same technique of paramagnetic properties 
applied to oxygenated and desoxygenated hemoglobin, which enable detection of metabolic change. This time the subject is doing a task, say for example, listening to human voice, and specific area of the brain involved in the auditory processing or whatever task the subject is doing will be highlighted and will be shown in a scan. During this, you can compare controls and autistic people. Much stu many studies have been done. Unfortunately, they all uh, use high-functioning autism and Asperger syndrome people. And it is not clear at all if these findings can correlate to the broader spectrum and the rest of the spectrum. So we need something else still to look at the brain function. And here what you have is PET and SPECT brain imaging. PET stands for positron emission tomography and SPECT is a single photon emission computerized tomography. Essentially the techniques are the same except that the labeling radioactive uh, compound is different. In PET, you have labeling of ligands, say, for example, um, receptor to dopamine. In SPECT, you have labeling of a substance which has good affinity for the gray matter. And it will show, um, essentially, the cerebral uh, cortex. You will be able to detect metabolic change which reflect the activity and the metabolism of the brain. It's very likely that this reflects mitochondrial function. What you can see here on the right is a, a SPECT scan of a person who suffers from a herpes virus encephalitis. And you can see the area of infection as being an area of higher um, cerebral blood flow. It's red. The area of infection can be seen also by MRI scan here with uh, more density of white density here. Using this technique, you can also detect area of epileptic activity. What you have here is two spect. One is a spect obtained during seizure, and another one is a spect obtained a post exhaust state after a seizure. It's possible to do a subtraction of the two images, leaving only the area with higher metabolic rate, which corresponds to the area with seizure activity, as being identified here. You can map it clearly onto this uh, brain structure.